My brothers and sisters, there is hardly a Muslim who doesn't know who Aisha radiallahu anha is. She is the beloved wife of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But what may uh, be the case is that we may not notice many a times just how much of a gateway to Islam she is for us. You see, the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ in particular, are the gateway to Islam. Were it not for Allah choosing that the first community be the best community, were it not for Islam being practiced as perfectly as humanly possible on a community level, happening with the Sahaba, we would be unsure for all of history which people got it right, which people got it most right. But also in terms of motivation to see that this can be upheld. Not just that this is the correct way, but that this is a doable way to live. Such purity, such exemplar conduct. But before I get to Aisha in particular, being such a gateway for Islam among the Sahaba, such an access point for us to really live our faith on higher levels, I wish to just begin this afternoon with realizing just how huge a role she played in terms of the space she owned in the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. Just how much she was loved by him and why. Because that is relevant to us, though it may not be intuitive immediately. It may not meet the eye at first glance. You know when Amr ibn al-As was given a, a position, an admirable position by the Prophet ﷺ upon becoming Muslim, he automatically assumed he must love me more than anyone. So he went after that mission that he was appointed to lead. He said, Ya Rasulullah, who is the most beloved person in the world to you? The Prophet ﷺ didn't say Amr, he said Aisha radiallahu anha. And he said, no, 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 I don't mean like, you know, the intimate love, the personal relationship love, the behind closed doors love between a man and a woman. Like he's saying, no, 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 I mean from men. He said, then her father. He still said her father. He didn't even say Abu Bakr, he said her father. In other words, when love was mentioned about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, immediately his mind went first leaned to the type of unique love he had for Aisha radiallahu anha. She was always on his mind. She was his outlet for his stressors. You know, so much so that in his final illness, he has the Sahaba, he has the other companions, uh, you know, carry him around, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, due to how weak he had become, and seek permission out of respect and the right of his other wives that he remain in that sickness being treated in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha. And ultimately, his blessed soul leaving this world as his head rested right on her upper chest radiallahu ta'ala anha wa ardaha. He preferred that. That's where he was most comfortable. To the extent also, there is actually a long-winded incident that's reported in the Sahih books that the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam when they wanted to give him a gift like they wanted to like cheer him up or like bake him something or make something nice for him they would wait till the day he was at Aisha's house because he would equ equitably fairly distribute his days so he would wait they would wait till the day he's at Aisha's house because you know when you want a, the gift to have the, the best impact like you package it the right way you put it in the right place you don't just give it to someone in passing right so they know that his spirits are the highest his, you know, stress is the least, despite all the busyness of the mission, despite assassination attempts and educating and planning and commanding and leading all of this in the house of Aisha. So then his wives actually had a meeting about this. They said, you know, like, how come? Like, everything goes her way. Nothing comes this way. So the mo one of the strongest of them, Umm Salama, radiallahu anha, she goes, Ya Rasulullah, your wives are demanding that you tell your companions to not single out Aisha, not only at Aisha's house. And of course, this is a very difficult request for the Prophet ﷺ. It would be embarrassing for Aisha for him to go out and say, don't give me gifts at Aisha's house. What is to be understood from that? Why not Aisha? And so he said to her, لا تؤذيني في Aisha. Don't hurt my feelings with regards to Aisha, for I swear by Allah, Revelation never came down upon me under anyone's blanket but hers. 
I've never received revelation when with my wives except when I am under the blanket with Aisha radiallahu anha. Allah chose her for that. But she didn't give up. Umm Salama went back and said, you know what? He can't say no to his daughter. So they send Fatima radiallahu anha to go make the same demand of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So his daughter comes and says, oh my father, and Aisha is there radiallahu anha. She says, your wives are demanding justice and fair treatment with regards to Aisha radiallahu anha. And so he even says to Fatima, come here. Do you love me? She said, yes, of course I love you. He said, فَأَحِبِّ هَذِهِ Then love this woman. Don't hurt her feelings. Don't scathe her emotions. Love this woman. So she went back and said to his wives, I'll never open this subject up with him again. So they sent Zainab, radiallahu <laughs> anha, who was, according to Aisha herself, she said she was the one that used to always compete with me in righteousness compete with me in devotion, compete with me, and she was more charitable because she had more money. Radiallahu ta'ana al jamia. So Zainab comes to the Prophet Sallallahu the next time he's with Aisha, and she says words that are a little forceful. She insulted Aisha, radiallahu nothing vulgar, but she insulted her. She was extra critical. Aisha says, and I looked at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and when I saw that he would not mind that I defend myself, I got up and I put her in her place. I silenced her. I, I vanquished her in the conversation. I stumped her. Not, nothing uh, profane. I just stumped her. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, She is the daughter of Abu Bakr. In other words, Abu Bakr is one of the most eloquent people of the Arab. Did you think you were going to win a debate with her? What did you expect when you insult her and she has the right to defend herself? She's going to win. But <clears throat> what I want sort of to, after drawing this image for you, what I want you to realize is that this is, this is not a personal preference of the Prophet Sallallahu Like you could say, how does this relate to me? Like, okay, he loved her most. He did not love her most randomly. He, it wasn't arbitrary. He didn't even choose her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you have to un understand this. In two authentic ahadith, he said to her, لَقَدْ أُرِيتُكِ فِي الْمَنَامِ مَرَّتَيْنِ I was shown you, you were displayed to me in my sleep. Allah sent me a vision twice in a piece of silk, meaning encased in a piece of silk or maybe sketched on a piece of silk. And Jibreel said to me, this is your wife, look at her. And so I uncovered, or, and I saw that it was you, and I said, in kana min Allah yumdi. If this is really what Allah wants, He's going to make it happen. I don't need to pursue it. I, Allah's going to make it happen. There's no avoiding it. If this is what's bound to be, this is Allah's qadr. The second hadith says, Jibreel alayhi salam showed you to me in a piece of silk, and he said, هَذِهِ زَوْجَتُكَ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ This is your wife in this world and in the hereafter. That's not arbitrary. That is not random, right? In other words, when you imagine, may we be allowed daily visits to our Prophet ﷺ in Jannah. Say, Ameen. You imagine that when you visit him in Al Firdaus Al A'la, she is always alongside him. She has gotten that station, earned it, if you will. By Allah's mercy, she has deserved that station right by his side in the height of the heights of Jannah. Why? That is the idea. It is not favoritism. Right? As Abdullah bin Mas'ud says, radiallahu anhu, Allah looked into the hearts of the slaves and found the purest of hearts to be the heart of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa And then he looked, and so he chose him for his prophethood, and he elected him for the, the highest rank of messengership. He chose him for the seal of prophethood. And then Allah looked into the hearts after the heart of Muhammad. Who's going to be around him? and elected the purest of those hearts and made them his disciples, his supporters, his defenders, the carriers of his legacy, the teachers of his message, fighting on behalf of his deen, pushing it and promoting it to the world for their welfare. And those were the Sahaba. The inner circle of the purest of hearts around Muhammad is Aisha. That's what I want you to understand. See her as a wonder of a woman, and that is why Allah chose for her, or chose for his prophet her.
صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم ورضي الله تعالى عنها and he even called our attention to this and he said you should not ever think that Aisha is normal when he said in one hadith that the women to have truly completed their faith were Maryam ibn Imran and Asiya ibn Muzahim alayhim was salam he said and the virtue the distinction of Aisha over any other woman is like the virtue of Tharid. Tharid is a certain meaty dish that they preferred over any other meal. He's trying to tell them that Aisha, the same way nobody differs over this dish, everyone knows this is number one, it's undebatable. It should not be a subject of debate, the distinction of Aisha in virtue and in rank with Allah Azza wa Jal and therefore with me and therefore it should be the same with you. It wasn't out of thin air. This is not just something unjustified and baseless. And then you go and you read her biography because you must. You read your, her biography because you should, because you owe it to yourself and to pray for her and to accustom your family to pray for her. As Allah Azza wa Jal said, the believers are those that say, رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ Oh Allah, forgive us and forgive the people that preceded us in faith. Read about her so you can increase in your love for her, your reverence for her, your, ad your admiration of her. And pray for her and make your family do so as well. You know, to mention to you quickly in these last five minutes about the, the unique league of her own piety this woman had. Al Qasim ibn Muhammad, one of her nephews, uh, Rahimahullah, he says, I one day visited my aunt, the mother of the believers, Aisha radiallahu anha, in the duha time. This is not night prayers, this is duha, meaning when the sun rises before dhuhr, before midday, right? You pray two rak'ahs or four or six or eight, what you can, light rak'ahs, that's what's customary, that's what's known. He said, I came and I stood waiting for her to finish praying her duha so I can greet her, greet my aunt, and go on with my day. But she kept praying. And so I said, you know what? Let me go to the market, finish some errands, and I'll come back. He said, I came back. Not only was she still praying, but she was still reciting the same exact verses. In Surah at tur when Allah Azza wa Jal was the, quoting the people of Jannah as saying, فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا وَوَقَانَا عَذَابَ السَّمُومِ Allah has conferred such a great favor upon us and spared us of the blistering winds of the hellfire. Inna kunna min qablu nad'uhu innahu huwa al-barru rahim We used to, the people of Jannah are saying, we used to call upon him, make such dua to him, so much supplication to him, and here we are, we made it, right? We used to make so much dua to him, indeed he is al-barr, the, the most kind, the uniquely kind, al-rahim, the most merciful. You see, she was weeping and repeating it, not able to get past it, not wanting to get past it. Because she understood. What did she understand? The people of Jannah that are saying, we used to be so worried, we used to be praying, and now we're in Jannah. You have to be those people here, so worried and so much praying, so that you can say, we used to be. So she was, she would stop and say, Allahumma qina adhab as-samoom, inna ka antal barru rahim Oh Allah, save us from the blistering winds of the fire. Oh Allah, you are the most kind, you are the most merciful. Urwa, her other nephew, the son of Asma and Az Zubair, radiallahu an al jami' used to say, and our mother Aisha fasted for the last 24 years of her life without interruption. Obviously meaning to the exclusion of the haram days, the days you cannot fast. Either because a woman is not praying or it's a Eid day and no one's allowed to fast on a day of Eid. Other than that, no exceptions. She fasted on a tear, a streak of 24 years without exception. And then she would live to serve others and especially those that are underserved, especially those that are stricken with poverty. Whatever she could give them, she used to give them. Anything she used to get her hands on, she used to give them. To the extent that in one narration, her servant saw her giving all she had, she had within reach was a grape. One grape was left from the plate, it was one grape. Someone asked, you know, I need a bite to eat. She gave them a grape. So the servant said, like, that makes absolutely no sense. Like, why are you doing this? Like, a grape is not going to fill anybody, and they're going to be just as hungry after the grape, like before the grape. What is that way? So she said back to her servant, Kem dharratin fiha. How many specks of dust does it weigh? 
because how close she was to the Quran. Because Allah Azza wa Jal said, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى Whomever does a speck's weight of good on the Day of Judgment will see it. How many specks of dust exist in this one grape? أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولك. الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله. بإذن الله we will revisit in the weeks to come other aspects of how we are so indebted to Aisha رضي الله عنها in many respects. But there is one final incident I would share with you regarding her charity uh, and her fear of Allah in particular. The piety that separated her from the pack. Because you know, someone can donate you know, 20 and someone can donate 10. It's just double. Someone you know, can uh, you know, fast 10 days, some fast 5. In physical actions, you can't really climb very far, right? We're all going to compare decently, practicing Muslims, inshallah. But it's the, what's happening inside you that really separates you. I wanted to highlight that. Aisha radiallahu anha would give out whatever she could reach to the point that one more nephew, <laughs> Abdullah ibn Zubayr, they just happen to all be nephews for what's coming to mind right now. Uh, Abdullah ibn Zubayr heard that Aisha would give away anything she could get her hands on to the poor. And he feared, number one, like such a, like a crude, simplistic, you know, lifestyle is very difficult. And she's getting older now. She lived 40 years after the Prophet ﷺ. And on the other hand, even if she could handle it, what if the Muslims start taking this as like normal? They won't be able to sustain it the way she could sustain it to just be so charitable. And then it backfires, right? You have a crisis of faith or something. And so he said, if my aunt doesn't stop doing this, I'm going to basically ban her from having money. I'm going to sort of usurp her financial autonomy. I'm going to freeze her accounts, if I can use a modern term, right? She heard this and she, the scholar Aisha, the scholar Aisha, we will speak about this, and also his aunt. She heard this, she was so offended by it that she swore and made a vow to Allah to never speak to him again. Never speak to her nephew again. How dare he? And for years on end, he would try to get people to vouch for him and she would refuse to speak to him. Until he finally got Miswar ibn Makhrama, one of the veteran Sahaba, and also Abdurrahman ibn al-Aswad, who would enter her house all the time, learn from her how the Prophet lived, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then step back out, teach it to the world, like major students. The seniors, her elders were her students. And we will speak about this. But in a nutshell, he said, please, figure out a way. Get me in on her. Please, let me just meet her. So they knock on her door like every day. They said, should we come in? She said, who are you? I, one man says, Abdurrahman ibn Aswad. Another man says, Misr al-Makhrama. Yes, enter. They said, all of us. She thinks they're two. They're three. She says, all of us. She said, yes, all of you. She's thinking it's a normal study day. She lets them in. As soon as Abdullah ibn Zubayr enters the room, he pulls the curtain and jumps inside and begins to weep and apologize and kiss her feet and beg her and beg her to speak to him. And she couldn't. She kept crying from the emotion and only addressing the other two men behind the curtain saying, I can't, I can't. The vow is a heavy vow. Allah's name is not to be treated lightly. I swore by his name. And they kept begging her and telling her, you know what Islam says about breaking family ties. You know what Islam says about boycotting relatives. Break your vow and make a kafara, make an atonement for it. Until finally, after a long back and forth, she caved and she gave in and she forgave him. They say she freed over 40 slaves until the day she died out of fear of breaking one oath. You know why? Because she made it an open-ended vow, some scholars said. It's not like, if I do this, I'm going to donate $1,000. She didn't put the leverage on it. She left it open-ended. So she felt cornered into, Allah will ask you your, your capacity. So she kept pushing herself to her capacity. Am I really doing my best? Am I really doing my best? Until she collected and spent to free 40 slaves and would still be fearful of this until the day she died from her deep piety, her deep recognition and fear of Allah and His rights, and the weight of Allah's name. And every time she would remember that incident of breaking her vow, she would soak her khimar in her tears. 
And that is what washed away any impurity from her, right? That is what raised her rank and earned her that station with our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah be pleased with her and enable us to love her and learn from her and live in the shade of her example and reunite us with our mother. Radiallahu ta'ala anha and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the highest of Jannah. Allahumma ghfil lana warhamna.